morning, Grace. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning on a glorious fall day. Isn't it beautiful? Thank you, Lord, for the beauty of this fall season. We welcome those of you who have tu tuned in on YouTube and on television. We are glad that you have joined us today as well. If you uh, would take out the attendance registration sheet you'll find in your bulletin, fill that out for us and put it in the offering basket as you leave today. That would help us in our ministry. We thank you for that. I have a few uh, announcements for you this morning. I wanted just to remind you that every Tuesday morning at 7.30 in the morning, a.m., 7.30, we are meeting at Hope Academy just outside of the building to pray for teachers and students and the administration uh, for the week. And we're, we have the privilege of praying with some of the teachers who join us at that time. So if you're free and you're up and you're ready to serve the Lord on Tuesday morning, we'd love to have you join us at 7.30 on Tuesdays. We had our uh, greeter and usher and parking host and bus driver appreciation breakfast yesterday, and one of the suggestions that came out of that breakfast was that we put the uh, new vision out and available for all of you to pick up a copy of it, and so you'll find this color of a sheet out on the Welcome Center on the left-hand side. You'll find a stack of them there. If you would like to read through that uh, before the November Grace Notes comes out, because it will be in November Grace Notes as well, but if you'd like one, there's a copy there. Please feel free to take it. Also, Sig and I just want to thank you all for the beautiful expressions of your appreciation and um, for all the varied cards we got. Uh, they have been beautiful, and you didn't duplicate very many times either, so it was kind of fun. We appreciate that very much. And now I just invite you to take a moment, and as you feel comfortable, greet one another and welcome each other to this time of worship.
It is good to be still before the Lord, to acknowledge He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Would you join us now by standing with us as you are able in the call to worship that you'll find on the screen behind me. All who thirst, come to the water. Come, all who are weary. Come, all who yearn for freedom. The Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ has washed over us. Our gracious and holy God beckons and blesses us. Drink deeply of these living waters. Glory to you, O Lord. Glory to you. Let's give glory to the Lord as we sing our opening hymn, God Hath Spoken by the Prophets. We're going to sing it to a very familiar tune, so let's sing. The words are on the screen. You may be seated. We'll take some time to be in prayer together before our Father's throne of grace. And as we come, would you remember this morning uh, Opal Rubin and her son Matthew? Opal um, is, is in the end of her life and has been removed from all life supporting kinds of care. So just pray that the Lord's timing in her life will be perfect and pray for Matthew as he waits on that. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. You're welcome to gather here with us and we'll pray the prayer that you have in your bulletin or on the screen. God of truth, we thank you for your holy word. 
for the promises, directions, and light we receive from it. Lord, teach us more of Christ. Help us retain his truth and grant us grace to walk in it. By your Spirit, help us to lift up the gates of our souls so that our Lord Jesus may enter in and reveal himself to us as we search your word. Lord, teach us more of Christ, the depth and breadth of his love and mercy, and grant us grace to follow in his way. Bless to our souls today all the grains of truth we gather from your word. Let them take deep root. Be refreshed daily by your heavenly dew. Be ripened by heavenly rays and harvested in joy and praise to you. Lord, teach us more of Christ and let his character be formed in us. We ask these things for the sake of those in the world who need to know your love and mercy who need to be refreshed by your word of truth, and who wait for your messengers to carry that truth to them. Lord, teach us more of Christ, and let the treasures we glean profit our souls, and become a fountain overflowing into your world. Overflow from us this week, Holy Spirit, with light and love, joy and peace, as we move among our families, in our communities, at Hope Academy, in hospitals and care facilities, and in our workplaces, overflow into the places of suffering and illness with the light of your truth, so that renewed hope and healing may arise. Overflow into places of conflict, so that your peace may calm the waters of strife and adversity. Overflow into hearts filled with grief, so that your comfort may surround them. Write your word upon our hearts and inscribe it on our lips so that all glory may be given to you, O Christ, as we carry your word into this world. In your name we pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Will you stand with me and join us as we sing together our hymn of preparation, O Word of God Incarnate. God. One day we will see him face to face, and for now we have his love letter to us. And so will you remain standing with me as you are able as we hear the word of the Lord from 2 Peter 1, verses 12 to 21. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. 
Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, if it's, if it's true that we sing our theology, I hope you've paid attention to those first couple of hymns we've sung because you could read through those and you'd get a pretty good synopsis of what this message is about, where it's going um, and what the outcome of it uh, hopefully will be. So let's, uh, let's pray. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. For your servants are listening. For your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is the next to last message in this series we've been uh, doing on a called community. And the synopsis of that is simply that we are a community that is called apart by God. We're called to be together in community and relationship with one another. And then we're sent out to minister and to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to a world that needs to hear him. We're called to serve him. Last week, we, we talked about living as, as thankful stewards of our material blessings, of our financial blessings, and, and using those to honor the Lord. This week, we're called by God through the Apostle Peter to be good stewards of his word, to make sure that we're being good stewards of what he has offered to us in the scriptures and in Christ Jesus. We have been given a treasure, an absolute gem, that which is so beneficial, so necessary for spiritual growth. It is a fountain of eternal life. Our calling is to know and respect, protect, obey, and then to share that word, that message to those who do not yet know him. Ever since God established a people for himself four millennia ago, now think about it, four millennia, not four decades, not four centuries, but four millennia ago, God established a people for himself. And ever since then, he has given us his word to protect and to proclaim. And, and just think about how amazing that is. Here we are in Decatur, Illinois, Grace United Methodist Church, and that word that has been handed down from generation to generation for 4,000 years has been given to us. We have been entrusted with it and asked to be good stewards of it in our own day, in our own generation. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Here's another way to say it, just in terms of the big picture. God's people are the depository of God's truth. First, first uh, place on your outline there. God's people are the depository of God's truth. In other words, God's word, his living word and his written word to us, his living word offered in Christ and his written word found in the Bible has been deposited with us as part of a long line of splendor of the faithful ones who have served him down through the years, down through the ages. He has given us his word and in his word we find his will for us, that his will might be lived out through us. If you look at the big picture in terms of the scripture, 1 Peter, the, the first letter of Peter, which was right before this one that we read from this morning, 1 Peter offers encouragement to the faithful who face persecution from outside of the church, and we know that that was going on throughout the, the early church. In 2 Peter, which is what we read from this morning, Peter wanted to guard the church from falsehood within the body of Christ. 
much of the rest of the letter, including that section just right after this at the beginning of chapter two, talks about the need uh, to be warned of false prophets, of false teachers, of those who threaten to lead the faithful astray. In a, in a time when, in, in the face of heresies that were being introduced and false teachings that were being created in the early church, Paul, or Peter said he wanted to firmly plant the early church's flag in God's truth found in the world, word as it was revealed. So don't miss this, don't miss this underlying belief here. And here it is. Our belief is that there is absolute truth and it's found in God's word. It's found in God's word. Truth is not easy to find in these days. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Begin to search for truth, and it's hard to come by um, uh, lots, lots of times. Well, contrary to the culture of our day, which says that all truth is relative, that is, each of us creates our own truth. You create your own truth. I create my truth. Everybody has their own truth. Contrary to that, God's people since the beginning have affirmed that when God speaks to us through the word, through the written word in the scriptures and through the living word found in Jesus Christ, it is the bedrock or foundation of our faith because it is absolute truth that cannot be changed. Why can we say that God's word is absolute truth? What gives us the right to do that? Well, the authority, the authority of God's word rests in the heart and the mind and the will of God himself. God's word began with him. That's why it's called God's word, because it originated with him and therefore reflects the character of God. God is always truthful. He never lies. He always tells the truth. And therefore, the gift he's given to us is always truthful. Jot down Psalm 119, verse 138, um, just alongside your notes there somewhere, and you can look at this later. But Psalm 119, 138 puts it this way. The psalmist says, The statutes you have laid down, O Lord, are righteous. They are fully trustworthy. Our Bible is called the Holy Bible because it comes from a holy God. Holy just means to be distinct from any other, to be separate from, to be something that's, that is set apart from everything else. And God is set apart from all of that which he has created, and he's given us a book, a holy Bible, which is set apart from every other book because it comes from God himself. And he gave us his truth. He gave us his, his truth through, through a variety of different authors, over a period of many, many years and, and in a variety of different ways using the gifts and personalities and words of each of the human authors. But all of it fits together. All of it fits together. All 66 of those smaller books fit together because God was the divine superintendent of this book we call the Holy Bible. As we'll see in just a few minutes, Peter in this letter affirms the divine origin of Scripture through those who wrote under the direction of God's Spirit. Dr. Billy Abraham, he just died a week and a half ago. We saw him at the New Room Conference. He was a couple, sitting a couple rows ahead of us, and he just died um, very unexpectedly uh, about a week and a half ago. But uh, I've... He's, he, was a, he was a great Wesleyan scholar. He taught at Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. And, and he had this to say just a couple of years ago at the Wesleyan Covenant Association meeting of which we were a part uh, about God's authorship of the word. This is what he said. He said, what's the primary task of scripture? According to 2 Timothy 3.15, it is to make us wise unto salvation and to enable us to come and be all God wants us to be in the life of the church. It's here to form us. It's here to change us. It's here to transform us. That's why there's such magnificent diversity in scripture. And Billy Abraham goes on to say, we read, we read it every week. We preach from it every Sunday because it makes us wise unto salvation. But one of the ways it makes us wise unto salvation is precisely that it gives us indispensable information about God 
and about ourselves and about how to come to God and what the future is going to look like. That is absolutely crucial information that comes from God and is mediated through the scriptures. Now listen to this next paragraph really carefully because I want you to, I want you to hear what, what he's saying here. When God speaks to us in scripture, God is not incompetent. When he said, what he says, no, let me back up and say that right. When he says yes, we understand it. When he says no, we can understand it. Otherwise, we've got a totally incompetent deity. Otherwise, we have a God who didn't make us in such a way that we could hear him and understand him. And when he speaks to us in his word, he can't get through to us. That's not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is not incompetent. He's spoken to us, and we're going to stand by that revelation that he's given us in Scripture. And we'll be immersed in Scripture to be all God wants us to be. God speaks to us through the Scripture. God speaks to us through Jesus Christ, and it is truth that he speaks to us. God is truth. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Therefore, the book given to us with God as the author is the truth. And Jesus Christ, the living word about whom the book is written, is the truth. And that means that the living word and the written word are in complete agreement with each other. Therefore, we would do well to hear and obey the word of truth Peter is writing about. So we have this deposit. It's been given to us. We are those who have received it. We are part of that depository of that truth. Well, what does Peter say to us about knowing and keeping the truth? As I worked on this passage this week, I, I just it broke it down into the three paragraphs, essentially, that are there. And I'm going to just give a point for each of those three paragraphs, beginning with the section verses 12 through 15. And, and here it is, the truth of God is to be remembered. The truth of God is to be remembered. Do you remember cramming for tests in school? Remember those, remember those days? You remember how it went? You, you pack as much information into your brain as you possibly can um, the night before and sometimes even right up to the time of the test. You want to make sure you try to remember it all and then you hold your head really, really, really still so none of it falls out. You, know, you don't want to lean this way or this way because it might fall out on your ears. And so you'll try to keep it in there. And as soon as the test is over, all that stuff that you remembered, it's gone. It's just, it's vaporized, right? Or we ask this question in the course of, of a, a lecture. Will this be on the test? In other words, if it's not going to be on the test, I'm not going to bother to try to remember it. What's the point of doing that? Well, Peter wanted to make sure that those that he had discipled in the first century church never forgot what he had taught them when he was gone. And did you hear in there? He knew that the time of his departure was coming. His death was drawing near. This, this was Peter's last will and testament in the spiritual realm. This is, this is what he said in, in verses 13 and 14. He said, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body tent of this body, he's talking about his physical body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And as we know, Peter, by tradition, Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy of, of being crucified as his Lord was. That's how he was put to death, and that time was drawing near. And he's giving his last will and testament to the early church, and he's wanting to make sure that the recipients of his letter remember the truth that he's taught them. He said it repeatedly. Verse 12, so I will remind you of these things. Verse 13, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this body. Verse 15, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. In other words, my beloved children, don't forget what I've taught you. Remember, hold on to God's truth. Don't ever forget. We can't remember what we don't know, can we? 
We can't remember what we don't know. So how do we remember? It's not through cramming. It's through repetition. It's through repetition. Repetition is a very good teacher. I was, rem I was reminded of that last weekend. We were, we were in Edwardsville for a couple of soccer games, and after the soccer games, uh, I was taken to the basketball court and in front of our uh, of one of our daughter and son-in-law's home, and I was schooled there. Um, I, I can't re tell you the last time I had a basketball in my hand, but it was a long time ago, you know, and I was a pretty good shot back then, and I thought, oh, yeah, okay. Pig, horse, round the world, sure, I'll, I'll be glad to take you on. Clunk, <laughs> clunk, clunk. Oh, yeah, use the backboard. Oh, can I get it up to that backboard? And, and sure enough, sure enough, um, even though I, I reminded them I didn't have the home court advantage, Evan and Annabelle and Jason, their father, all whipped me every time. And what made the difference was Evan and Annabelle and Jason repetitiously shot on that court. Time after time, after time, after time. I'd never been on their particular driveway to play before, and it showed. You see, repetition is a very good teacher. Repetitious investment of ourselves in God's word also cements the deposits of his truth in our hearts and minds. Here's a quote from Eugene Peterson who wrote the message translation of the Bible. He said, when we find ourselves deficient in wisdom, it's not because the word of God has pages missing, but because we have not seen all there is on the pages we already have. It's not just another book we need, but better attention to the book we have. It's not more knowledge we require, but better vision to see what has been revealed, already been revealed in Jesus Christ. Now friends, that's a pretty clear call to discover and incorporate God's word regularly, repetitiously into our lives. I know myself well enough to know that if I'm not constantly and consistently in the Word, I will soon forget. That was Peter's concern for those he was discipling in the faith. He said right at, at that time, in that passage we just read, that those that he was writing to were firmly established in the truth, but he knew from his own experience that that didn't mean anything necessarily for the long term, that there needed to be continued experience with the word that had been planted in them. Because what happens? Circumstances change. Fear comes along. Clever arguments change our minds and behaviors. We sometimes get wobbly about what we believe. I love that word when thinking about it. We get wobbly, you know, where we lose our certainty. We, we're not sure that it's all completely reliable. And it's possible Peter was remembering his own experience with Jesus. You remember that? How he made claims about firmness of faith and how they didn't automatically translate into holding on to the truth. Remember his claim as Jesus approached Jerusalem and, and Peter said to him, if everybody else abandons you, I will never abandon you. And what did he do? when Jesus was arrested with all the other disciples, disappeared into the night. And then even later in that night, three times he denied he ever even knew Jesus Christ. He, he remembered that he bailed out. And he knew from firsthand experience that one's faith could get wobbly. It's also possible for us to be carried away from truth based on false doctrine. We can, any of us can succumb to falsehood promoted by our culture or by the evil one or even by charlatans in the church who would lead us astray out of ignorance or for selfish reasons. Let's learn the truth of the word so we can remember the truth of the word on deposit with us and never forget or be led astray. Remember, remember, remember. There's a second thing Peter said about knowing and keeping the truth. And that is the truth of God is rooted in historical events. Historical events. Verses 16 through 18. 
Peter wanted his readers to know that God's truth found in the Bible is not based on fairy tales. It's not once upon a time and they lived happily after, ever after kind of a story. That's not what it is. Peter said that the church did not, does not, and will not follow cleverly invented stories. We don't make it up as we go along. Peter said that the truth he knew that came through the living word was based unequivocally on historical facts. And therefore, it is utterly reliable. Jesus Christ is the living word who came into the world as God's truth. He claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. And by the way he lived and died, Jesus proved that he was the way, the truth, and the life. Because Jesus was the truth, he spoke the truth, he lived the truth, he gave his Father's truth to us. During his earthly ministry, he affirmed the truthfulness and authority of the Bible as God's word. So the event that that Peter refers to here in 2 Peter is, as he was talking to his readers, was about the time that he and James and John went up onto, onto the, the Mount of Transfiguration. That's what we call it. It's probably Mount Hermon is, is where it was. It was recorded in Matthew 17 and a couple other places in the scripture. And Jesus was transfigured before them. He became so bright, he was as bright as lightning flashes. They couldn't even look at him. and and. Moses and Elijah showed up and there was a powwow of those, those big three. And then God the Father spoke to Jesus with a voice that the three disciples heard. Peter said, on my word, the transfiguration really happened. And it gives credence, it gives credibility to the authority and power of Jesus Christ as the truth of God. Along with that event, we know that Peter was also the primary spokesman for the disciples on the day of Pentecost. You can read about it in Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament. And he, and he spoke about the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That too was an historical event based upon the truth of God's word. Peter was saying, we aren't making this stuff up. It really happened. Jesus Christ is the real deal. The witnesses agree. Jesus Christ, the living word of God, is true and reliable. The book that points to him is the real deal. So that means the Old and the New Testament, Testaments, the written word of God, they are true and reliable. In addition, the disciples of Jesus are true and reliable witnesses because they saw it with their own eyes, they experienced it. They had the credentials for proclaiming the truth and they staked their very lives on that truth. We can believe them, even to this day. There's a third thing about knowing and keeping the truth and this is it. The truth of God was given through the Holy Spirit. That's verses 19 through 21. Verses 19 through 21. Because Peter added another set of witnesses to the truth of God. It was, it was more than just God himself. It was more than Christ Jesus, the, the living word. It was more than just the disciples of Jesus. Now he adds the prophets into the mix. He said the prophets spoke on God's behalf in the Old Testament. They didn't do so out of their own interpretation. Again, they didn't make the stuff up. They spoke from God. And what came forth from them was not human will, but the will of God. Peter is emphatic. He said, those who spoke and wrote the Old Testament into being spoke from God as they were carried along. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, Peter's saying, this is God speaking. <laughs> Pay attention. Peter, the fisherman, who spent many years on the Sea of Galilee in a boat, added a sailing imagery right here to explain the work of the Holy Spirit in giving us God's word. The, the prophets were carried along. It was, it was as though the wind was blowing their sail. It was as though that was what was propelling them forward. The wind, the wind of the Spirit was blowing them right in the right direction. Blow, Spirit, blow. And the Spirit blew and the prophets spoke forth and then wrote down the words of truth that God gave to them. I want to just give you one example. I could give you multiple examples of prophets, but Jeremiah is one of those from the Old Testament that was carried along by the wind of the Spirit. 
in the face of all of those who had shut him up, and there were plenty that wanted to do that for this prophet, he said, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, these are his words in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, but if I say, I will not mention the Lord or speak any more in his name, his word is like, is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. He had to speak it forth. He had to. The Word of God and the Spirit of God cannot be separated. Can't separate those two. As surely as God spoke to the prophets in the writing of His Word, so He speaks to us in, as we read His Word and He applies it to our lives. This is what Martin Lloyd Jones, who's a longtime pastor of Westminster Chapel in London, said about the importance of the Holy Spirit. He said, There's nothing more dangerous than putting a wedge between the Word and the Spirit. A wedge that would emphasize either one or at the, or at the expense of the other. It is the Spirit and the Word. The Spirit upon the Word. And the Spirit in us as we read the Word. Do you hear the Trinitarian nature of the revelation of God's truth that we find in 2 Peter 1? The entire Trinity gets involved in the authorship and authority of God's Word. God is trustworthy. God the Father is trustworthy. He's given us His Word. Jesus Christ is the truth that came from the Father. And now the Holy Spirit, as the means by which God spoke to us, did so through human authors. And here's the truth of it. They all agree. And then on top of that, you add, in, you add in the disciples and you add in the prophets and you've got witnesses that give great credibility to the content and the truthfulness of God's word. Friends, welcome to a long line of splendor of those who have been guardians and protectors of the deposit of great value that we've been given, God's truth. So what do we do with this treasure with which we've been entrusted. I'm going to add a word to the depository that I gave at the beginning. We're not only a depository for God's word, but God's people are also dis the dispensary of God's truth to those who need it. The truth has been deposited with us, but we're to dispense it to others, those who need it. Until the return of Jesus Christ, we're to share the good news about Jesus found in God's word with a wor world that is thirsty and hungry for God's truth. And here's what we can say as we dispense that truth. Because God's word is truthful, it is useful. <laughs> a, a written document that isn't true isn't worth much, is it? You know, just for example, if I was going to catch a flight out of, out of St. Louis and my itinerary, my itinerary said that the flight left at 10, 10 a.m. And I got there and I found out that the flight actually had already left at 7 a.m. Then the untruthful itinerary isn't helpful at all to me. Because the Bible is truthful in everything it speaks, I can count on the Bible being one of the most important and valuable resources for my spiritual life. It guides me, it leads me into God's presence, it corrects me when I'm wrong, it challenges my thinking and my lifestyle, it shapes my life, and it motivates me to serve the author more fully. In other words, God's word works. It is useful. And if it works for me, it will work for anyone. The very resource of what we're to offer to others who are living in the darkness of our world is what they need for full and abundant and eternal life that comes through the light of Christ shining in dark places. So we remember God's word. And we do so systematically and regularly as we invest ourselves in it. We believe in God's word because it's based upon actual events that unfolded in our world. And third, we apply the truth of God's word by the presence and power of his Holy Spirit within us. But our stewardship of God's word is incomplete if only we get the benefit. If we're the only ones who get the, the benefit of that. Because on top of all of those things, we share it with others. We dispense it so others can share in what we already have. As it was true in the first century church through Peter and Paul and the other disciples. 
Hear what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.2. Hear these words as the very call of God for you and for our congregation here at Grace United Methodist Church in this day. Hear these words. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men and women who will also be qualified to teach others. In other words, the truth you have been given, even as you've heard it today, hold on to it, believe it, live it, trust it, and then hand it off to others who can in turn do the same for others. That's our, that's our call. That's the call of God. That's the invitation of God to our lives. So may it be so, Lord. Help us to that end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we respond to this word we've heard this morning, the invitation to the offering comes from Proverbs 11, verse 25, and it says this, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. What a blessing to give when we know that our giving is going to make a difference in refreshing the lives of others, even as we are continually refreshed by the Word and by the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the case when you give to the work of the Lord at grace. The refreshment that you bring in your offerings flows out from this community of faith into the community around us and far beyond, into the lives of children and parents, into the lives of older adults and young adults, into ministries of evangelism and ministries of care, your generosity put to work through the life of this church by the Holy Spirit is a river of refreshment out into the world. So we invite you to give this morning in the baskets that are at the back of the sanctuary. You can give online on our website or through the mail. But let's give to the Lord knowing that together we are a refreshing river flowing out into this community and beyond.
and hallelujah to the King of Kings. Will you bow with me as we pray a prayer of dedication over our offerings this morning? Oh, thank you, Heavenly Father, for the refreshment of your word and spirit that we receive every week as we worship together and every day as we drink deeply from your scripture. Receive the gifts we give today and let them truly become refreshment in the lives of others, lifting up those bowed down with the weight of the world, comforting those who grieve, and leading the lost home to you. We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory alone. Amen and amen. I'd invite you to stand and join us now as we sing together our closing hymn, Lord, Speak to Me. So, Lord, speak to me. That's what we just sang. You know what? There is nobody in this room, there's nobody within the sound of my voice that the Lord can't speak to directly. And so if we ask him to speak to us, he will speak to us. And if you did not hear him speak to you in this service, then continue to ask him to speak to you, and he will speak to you. And this is what he'll tell you. He'll say, I love you dearly. I love you dearly. You are my child. I want a relationship with you. Hear me as I tell you how much I love you. I was willing to send my son into the world to die on a cross that you might know of the depth of my love. That is God's truth. You can stake your life on it. And as we say, Lord, speak to me, then this is what the Lord says to us. Now take what I have spoken to you and go out into the world and share it with others so that others can hear the good news from me as well. They can hear about my love and my grace. Lord, speak to me. And then, Lord, use me to speak to others. May it be so, and may the peace of Christ be upon you. Amen. Amen.